Hello friends, welcome to An Academy. Let's crack neat PG. I'm Dr. Shonali Chandra and in today's session I will be taking up instruments and some important procedures which we perform in the labor room. I've highlighted my reference code here that is S-H-O-N-A-L-I. So if you take a plus subscription from the Unacademy platform, you can use this code to avail a 10% discount on your subscription package. You can also download the Unacademy Learning app on your phone as well. And if you take a subscription of the Unacademy platform, you'll get daily live class where you can chat with your, edit, uh, with your educator, ask your doubts and queries and you know get them solved there and then. So it's like a live classroom experience. The courses are structured, keeping in line with the latest NEAT PG syllabus. There are also live tests and quizzes which are conducted on the platform. They will help you evaluate your performance as you go along. And most importantly, one subscription gives you unlimited access. So you can watch all of the live sessions from all the faculties who are active on the platform. And even if you miss out on the live sessions, you can always go back and watch the recorded versions from the comfort of your own devices. Top educators are associated with the platform. All 19 subjects which we need to prepare for our post-grad entrance examinations, they are covered. And every now and then comprehensive batch courses and also short duration crash courses, they keep getting launched. So you can check out the ongoing courses in the platform as well. And uh, there is a new subscription package that is being launched that is the iconic subscription which will allow you to access two platforms simultaneously an academy and prep ladder so you can join with the plus platform or with the iconic platform so if you choose the iconic platform you can subscribe for 12 months 18 months 24 months or 36 months and if you take uh, the subscription package using my code that is s-h-o-n-a-l-i then you can avail a 10 percent additional discount on your subscription package as far as the plus subscription packages are concerned you can also take a short duration package like one month or three months so if you're targeting the next upcoming exams you know you can want a crash course there so you can choose the one month or three month subscription and for those of you who are planning for the next exam they can take the longer duration 12 month subscription package turns out to be more economical in the longer run and for those of you who are wanting a slower pace of preparation you're still in your third year or final year MBBS you can take the 24 month subscription it turns out to be far are more economical in the longer run and if you subscribe using my code that is s-h-o-n-e-l-i then you can avail a 10 percent discount on your subscription package as well and where else you can find me you can find me on the unacademy platform taking special free live classes uh, topics like abnormal uterine bleeding menstrual cycle regulation pcos uh, clinical approach to primary amenorrhea and secondary amenorrhea and also various topics from obstetrics have been covered on the special classes as well you can also find me taking plus courses on the academy on academy platform so there's a complete capsule course on labor and its complications all also, there are plus courses which I have conducted earlier, like there's a capsule course on reproductive gynecology, on high-risk pregnancy, and in gynae cancer. So you can find me there as well. So coming back to the session at hand for today, we are we are going to uh, revise some of the instruments and procedures which we conduct in the labor room. So I can see a lot of you have joined in. So good evening, Kulsum, Lakshmi and Ali. I welcome you all to the session today. So without wasting any further time, let us have a look at the instruments that I have chosen to discuss with you today. So can you identify this forceps? for me here and to help you aid in your identification I also want you to have a look at the end of these forceps here and if I will zoom into it you will realize that they are toothed forceps right so there is a gap here and there is a tooth here that fits into that gap so yes they can be curved they might be straight uh, so what are these forceps can you identify these special forceps that you see in the labor room so good evening dr house 
Anybody taking a guess at what these forceps are? Have you seen them in your labor rooms? So they are used for various purposes, you know, clamping and holding on to tissue. So these are, yes, these are not artery forceps. Artery forceps Ali will not have this hook at the top. That's why I told you to have a close look at the uh, mouth of the forceps there. So they won't have a tooth. Artery forceps are going to be straight like that. So this is, yes, these are the Cocker's forceps, Hafsa and Shubham Kumar rightly identifying. These are not the artery forceps. Artery forceps will not have that hook here, will not have that hook here at the top of the forceps fitting into another. So these are very good at grasping and pulling at tissues for that matter. So where are these used? These are the Coker's hemostatic forceps. So yes, you can use them in place of artery forceps, you know, where you want to clamp tissues in between the blade of the forceps. But particularly in obstetrics in the labor room, they are used to perform ARM. ARM is a procedure which we call as the artificial rupture of membranes. And yes, you can use it as a clamp also you can use it to clamp the umbilical cord as well so these are the Coker's forceps now let me just elaborate on the procedure that is artificial rupture of membranes that we do in the labor room so what is this procedure this is a procedure where we use the Coker's forceps they can be straight or they can be curved and they are introduced into the vagina guided by the fingers like this and they are introduced to grasp the membranes to grasp the fetal membranes here. So you can see that this is the baby's head which is descending down into the pelvis. We can see that the cervix here is also dilated and that is causing this bulging bag of membranes. You can identify this bulging bag of membranes, right? So normally these bag of membranes are forming during the course of labor. And if I don't intervene in between, they can rupture during any time during the course of labor. But most of the times these bulging bag of membranes rupture after full dilatation of the cervix. But sometimes during the course of labor, we tend to do artificial rupture of membranes, right? So what is the role of this artificial rupture of membranes? We rupture these membranes, the liquor gushes out. So how does this help? What is the use of this uh, procedure which we call as the artificial rupture of membranes? Now, sometimes we can also use this device which the obstetrician, you know, wears on his gloved finger. Now, this is what we call as the amnicot. I mean, uh, amnicot is also used to perform the same procedure that is artificial rupture of membranes or ARM. So this uh, device, uh, you can simply roll it over your fingers, over the gloved fingers of course, and it has a small sharp hook. So while doing the per vaginal examination, we can poke with this hook on the membranes to do artificial rupture of membranes. This device which we wear on our gloved fingers is called the amnicot. If this is not available, yes, most of us have been doing ARM with the uh, Cocker's forceps. Yes, so I'm getting some very, very interesting answers about what this ARM procedure is going to do. And all of you are right. It is going to make labor go faster. It can be used for induction of labor. It is going to prolong second stage. So Satya, DR house. And Satya is also answering it is going to lead to release of prostaglandin. So wonderful answers by all of you there. Right. So when these fetal membranes are ruptured, it releases prostaglandin that is also correct right and therefore ARM this procedure helps in ripening of the cervix it also helps in you know increasing the intensity of uterine contractions so when we feel during the course of labor that the labor is not progressing as expected in the active phase mind you in the active phase of labor once the woman has crossed the active phase threshold of the first stage of labor and we realize that the uterine contractions are inadequate and we want to, uh, you know, augment the labor, that is when we use this procedure. So the advantages of ARM are that it is going to cause the labor to go faster. It is going to increase the uterine contraction. So that is how it is helpful. All right. And yes, of course, it is not to be done for all set of women. You see, there has to be an indication for performing ARM. Like if there is a 
slow progress of labor then i would like to go for this procedure now another important role of this is that it is going to induce cervical ripening so it also helps in cervical ripening so it can be used as a method for induction of labor as well right <clears throat> The other important aspect of this is that it is going to give us an idea about the color of the liquor as well, isn't it? So when the liquor is going to leak out, when the amniotic fluid is going to leak out, I can identify the color of the liquor. So sometimes there might be a meconium stained liquor, which will help me make further decision about the course of labor progress. Or there can be a blood stained liquor, like when I'm doubtful situation, when I'm thinking that it might be placental abruption, then I can find blood blood stained liquor so in the presence of blood stained liquor i will also suspect that there is a possibility of placental abruption right so whenever there is this placental abruption which is identified during the course of labor as long as the mother and baby are doing well i need to augment the labor and make it go faster right so in the cases of abruption of placental abruption arm procedure helps me to confirm the diagnosis as well as to augment the uterine contractions which are going to be required in the cases of placental abruption so there are many advantages of this procedure which is ARM but mind you it is not supposed to be done for every woman who is going into uh, the uh, uh, who is going into labor it is only done when indicated okay now moving on to the next uh, instrument here can you identify these scissors for me can you identify these scissors for me? These are very specifically designed scissors. I mean, they, you have seen all scissors of all kinds, long scissors, short scissors. You've seen straight scissors. Now, there's something very peculiar about these scissors. They are curved. They are exactly at an angle from this joint. So, they are curved at an angle here. So, what are these forceps, guys? Yes, very good, Jotsna and Hafsa. These are episiotomy scissors. They are characteristically described as episiotomy scissors. You identify it. It is bent on the edge, right? There is a blunt tip. There is a blunt tip and there is also a sharp tip. Now, the blunt tip goes inside the vagina. The blunt tip goes inside the vagina. That is very, very important to note, right? So, this blunt tip is the, because inside the vagina the fetal head is also there right so we need to avoid injury to the fetal head therefore it is the blunt tip which goes inside the vagina and the procedure that we uh, do with these scissors is to give an incision over the perineum during the course of delivery of the baby now something that is not routinely done something that is not routinely done but done if required is a procedure which we call an episiotomy in which we give an incision over the perineum now in this particular figure they are using straight forceps in this particular figure they are using straight forceps but yes specially designed episiotomy forceps curved forces are available can you tell me why these scissors are curved at an angle why is it that they have specially designed an episiotomy scissor which is particularly curved at an angle why is that important the answer to that question lies in the figure itself can you identify why they are specially curved why they are specially curved any re any particular reason for that any particular reason for that the answer lies in the figure here so you can see here i'll just describe what is happening to you the scalp of the baby is visible distending the perineum so the perineum is thin and stretched okay it's a thin and stretched perineum the scalp is distending the outlet you can see the hair that are visible there so you can see the scalp there this timing is called as crowning this is what we call as crowning when the scalp becomes visible at the introitus right and it doesn't recede back once the contraction is over that time is called as crowning now what has happened the perineum is thin and distended right so when we cut the perineum when it is thin and distended at the right time at the right instance of crowning the amount of blood loss during episiotomy is decreased because the perineum is not thick it is thin and stretched out now when we are cutting the perineum at that point you know we want to ensure that the cut goes at an angle the cut goes at an angle of 60 degrees to the midline that has to be ensured because it's a thin and 
dense test perineum if we are going to cut it much closer to the midline right we won't realize while we are cutting okay we won't realize while we are cutting we'll think that we are far from the midline but once the baby delivers and the perineum is no longer stretched we'll realize that we've cut cl quite close to the midline now i don't want to come very close to the midline while cutting the perineum because i want to avoid injury to the anal sphincter and to the anus that is right behind at six o'clock position right so that is the reason why these episiotomy scissors are characteristically curved in this manner so that we stay far away from the midline now if you're using a straight uh, straight tissue cutting scissors like the one shown in the figure make sure that the angle of the cut is directed 60 degrees at least to the midline there right so they are curved the curve, the curve is because of, not because of preventing trauma to the fetus. I mean, we are preventing the trauma to the fetus by introducing our fingers right behind, right? So, if fingers are introduced right behind the point where I'm going to give the cut. That protects the fetus. The fact that the, um, uh, the uh, blunt blade would go inside will prevent the injury to the fetus. And our fingers will protect the injury to the fetus. But the angle is there to avoid staying close close to the midline right so please ensure that the cut is about 60 degrees to the midline now this kind of episiotomy which we perform here in this figure shown is the mediolateral episiotomy is what we call as the mediolateral episiotomy right now the other question that they ask you in the exams is what are the structures which are cut during the episiotomy now my request to all of those who are watching this session is that if you've not had the opportunity yet to witness a vaginal delivery to witness this episiotomy make sure that you take part in your labor room postings and see it for yourself because then it becomes much more clearer as to what structures are cut during the episiotomy how is it performed how is it done at your institute make sure that you see it and make use of your labor room postings there so what are the structures which are cut during the episiotomy in this particular figure let's see what structures are cut so we can see here that the overlying skin of the perineum is cut right so the perineal skin is cut during an episiotomy that uh, the incision also extends into the vagina I mean it's been sutured now here in the figure it has already been sutured but the vagina is also cut vaginal mucosa is cut now the perineal muscles which are in this area right you can see the cut end of the muscles here right there's subcutaneous fat and tissue that is also underlying the skin that's also cut so the transverse perineal muscles both the superficial and the deep group of transverse perineal muscles fibers of those muscles are cut bulbospongiosis uh, muscle which extends anteriorly from here it is also cut so fibers of the bulbospongiosis muscle are also cut and some fibers of levator ani muscle are also cut so these muscle fibers are cut during episiotomy and also the nerves that are supplying this area of the perineum the blood vessels that are supplying this area of the perineum so these superficial branches the perineal branches the superficial perineal branches of the pudendal nerves and the internal pudendal vessels and the internal pudendal vessels they are also cut during the procedure so please note that these are the structures that are cut during the episiotomy they can, this can be asked of you in the viva exams this is also form a part of the mcqs as well so what do we realize we realize that episiotomy is nothing but a second degree perineal tear Episiotomy is a type of second degree perineal tear because the muscle layer is also cut during this procedure right now when the time to suture this episiotomy comes very very important point to note for the MBBS viva examination that when the time to suture this episiotomy comes we need to ensure that we include the apex of the vaginal incision into the suture and we don't miss out on this apex that I'm pointing here because there are tendencies you know especially when the episiotomy is too deep into the vagina and we are very hurriedly suturing, suturing 
puncturing you know we can miss the apex and then it can lead to uh, bleeding at a later point in time can lead to hematoma formation on the episiotomy site in at later point in time so it is very very important to include the apex of the vaginal incision into the suture right so how do we ensure that we ensure that by at least taking the first bite of suture beyond the apex at least a centimeter above the apex we start suturing okay so we suture the vaginal mucosa first like the one shown in the figure right so the vaginal mucosa is sutured first okay and thereafter we extend the sutures into the muscle layer as well can you see the sutures being applied in the muscle layer then the muscle layer is sutured this is the second layer of the suture okay and then the third layer of suture is on the layer of the skin and thereafter the skin is sutured the last that's your third layer of suture right so this episiotomy is sutured in a layered manner okay now talking about the suture materials that are used for stitching the episiotomy so what suture materials have you seen being used guys what suture materials have been you seen being used? So various institutes along with the availability of the suture material, along with the cost that goes on to buying the sutures for the patient's care, you know. So there are many factors which govern which are the suture materials that are used. And I would urge for the students who are appearing for MBBS YY examinations to take note of the suture which is being used in their institute. All right. So there are various suture materials which are used for this purpose. We are using chromic catgut also uh, chromic catgut has also been used and your vicryl vicryl has also been used right? so the vicryl is your polyglactin 910 910 so that's your vicryl suture that is used so chromic catgut suture was very good suture it's uh, you know it's uh, it's a uh, a delayed absorbable it's not too delayed absorbable it gets absorbed in about uh, seven days right but then there is more chances of the wound breakaway and more chances of infection with the chromic catgut so vicryl is a very good suture and uh, there's a very less risk, risk less risk of infection with vicryl but the tendency for vicryl is that it is a delayed absorbable suture so there are many times that women complain of feeling that you know knots there at that side the suture can be felt by the woman so nowadays in most of the institutions the suture that is available i'm sure you must have identified is the rapid vicryl suture okay proline is permanent suture <clears throat> shubham proline is your permanent type of suture you don't play permanent you need absorbable sutures okay you need absorbable sutures so the woman will not come back to you for to removal of stitches will not happen these are going to be absorbable sutures so chromic catgut uh, you must have seen that uh, goldenish brownish suture right and then the, the vicryl is that bluish colored suture which is there and then you have a white colored suture if you have identified that is your rapid vicryl so it gives all the advantages of vicryl also very smooth suture very good suture uh, less risk of infection and since it's rapid vicryl it gets absorbed in about seven days so uh, combines the rapidity of the chromic catgut combines the good effects of the vicryl as well so that's a white colored thin suture rapid vicryl and that is what is very commonly used in most of the institutions so do identify what suture material they are using at your institute okay now moving on further my next question to you is why do you prefer a mediolateral episiotomy and not a midline episiotomy i mean if at all you have to give an episiotomy first of all remember that it's not a routine procedure no matter what you might have seen you might have seen episiotomies being given uh, to all women or to all primary gravidas or to multi gravidas but episiotomy should be a restricted procedure it's not recommended to be freely used in every woman okay so why do you prefer to use a medial lateral episiotomy and not a midline episiotomy can anybody answer that question yes what is wrong with a midline episiotomy i mean midline episiotomy comes with its own set of advantages as well i mean you know there are advantages to midline episiotomy but there is a major disadvantage with midline episiotomy and that's why we don't prefer to use it when required Hafsa, that is not the correct answer to provide space for expulsion of the baby to provide space for expulsion of the baby we are using episiotomy okay that 
that is an indication for using episiotomy if we feel that the perineum is uh, too rigid it is not distending it is interfering with the delivery of the baby's head or we have to perform maneuvers like forceps application or vacuum application or i have to do any other maneuvers to deliver the baby and when i feel that the space is less then i perform an episiotomy that's an indication for an episiotomy but why to prefer a mediolateral episiotomy over a midline episiotomy there are two possible sides of episiotomy now look at this look at this incision on the perineum now this is an incision which is given over the midline now see this incision this is given mediolaterally this is a mediolateral episiotomy here on the other hand it is given on the midline the same structures are cut the same structures are cut but what is the problem here if it extends posteriorly if it extends posteriorly on its own the baby is delivering and the incision extends posteriorly or i need to extend the incision as my requirement then i have no other choice you see it will go and extend to the external anal sphincter it will go extra extend to the external anal sphincter and the anus right behind yes so at a later point in time it can lead to at a later point in time it can lead to fetal incont fecal incontinence stool incontinence flatus incontinence so anal sphincter injuries i want to avoid right so i want to avoid anal sphincter injuries that is why i prefer a mediolateral episiotomy and that should be your answer to avoid anal sphincter injuries in case the episiotomy extends backwards or in case the need to extend the incision of episiotomy arises all right so that's your correct answer there so if you compare the midline versus the mediolateral episiotomy a lot has been done to compare the midline versus the mediolateral episiotomy the midline increases the risk of anal sphincter injuries right and the mediolateral episiotomy avoids that risk right otherwise the midline episiotomy bleeds less okay the midline episiotomy also heals faster also heals faster right and also pains less also pains less right so the mediolateral episiotomy on the other hand bleeds more okay it will heal a uh, slightly it will heal uh, slightly it will take longer to heal as compared to the midline episiotomy it will also pain more to the woman at a later point in time so it's not that the episiotomy is going to lead to no complications at all it's going to bleed more it will take longer to heal it is going to pain more right but the advantage that is gained by mediolateral episiotomy is that it avoids the risk of anal sphincter injury so we have to arrive at a balance somewhere the balance is that episiotomy should not be used as a routine because it comes with its own set of complications so episiotomy mind you please remember it is not a routine procedure it is only given when required it is only given when required okay so keep that in mind as well i mean routine episiotomies has not been found to decrease the risk of perineal injuries during the conductance of deliveries please remember that important point it's not like if you routinely give episiotomies you are going to avoid perineal injuries during delivery okay so keep that in mind now let's have a look at the next instrument <clears throat> next instrument and that's a very common instrument all of us have seen it yes this is the foley catheter this is the foley catheter now why uh, now if you talk about the uses of the foley's catheter they are pretty obvious isn't it drainage of the bladder monitoring the urine output these are pretty obvious you know uses of the foley catheter i mean monitoring of the urine output in a, a patient with hypovolemic shock and drainage of the bladder during the uh, delivery or drainage of the bladder post operative operatively after a cesarean section or post operatively after any surgery when the woman is under the effect of anesthesia in the ot then also we go for this intraoperative bladder drainage so the 
the that is the usual uses of Foley's catheter. But one of the very very important uses of Foley's catheter in obstetrics, which I need you to understand, is balloon tamponade in atonic PPH. Right now, there are specially designed balloons which are available for specifically designed for the purpose of tamponading in a cases of atonic PPH, like the Bakri balloon. Uh, people have also used the Sengstern and Blackmore balloons for the same purpose. But then these balloons, which are specially designed, they're expensive. They're not. They might not be freely available in labor rooms and you know in our situation here in the government hospitals. Such specifically designed balloons are not available all the time. So if we want to do a balloon tamponade in a tonic PPH case, and I don't have a specially designed balloon with me, I can use this Foley's catheter. I can use this Foley's catheter and create a condom catheter out of it. That is what your examiners want to hear. Are you aware of this condom catheter which uses this Foley's catheter? Condom catheter can be made for balloon tamponading in a tonic PPH case. So you see this is the Foley's catheter, right? And this is the bulb of the Foley's that has been inflated and a condom in the deflated state, the condom has been tied by a suture around this bulb of Foley's catheter. Now in the deflated stage, this balloon, this condom, uh, this, uh, condom catheter can be introduced into the uterine cavity. Okay, a uterine cavity, uh, the uterus is atonic there is atonic postpartum hemorrhage that is happening and we put this balloon inside the uterine cavity in the deflated state then from this end of the Foley's catheter we push in saline we instill saline inside this balloon okay the balloon that has been made out of the condom and then we inflate it with saline and that provides the tamponading effect on the uterus so this can be used as a method of balloon tamponade in cases of atonic PPH in situations where your specially designed Bakri balloons and uh, you know specially designed uh, Sengstern or Blackboard balloon they are not available so condom catheter can be used in those situations especially advantages in situations when you are you know when you're stuck in a situation where let's say you're working in a peripheral healthcare center and a woman is having a tonic pph you have exhausted the utrotonics that are available to you and then you decide that you have to refer the woman you don't have the necessary equipment there at your center so to buy time for the woman you know if you put this condom catheter in place and then you refer the woman then sometimes is bought you know at least to do something to control the bleeding in a case of atonic pph there so this is particularly useful under those situations right so nepaulin you are saying that other uses of the catheter are improved improvised as tourniquet for myomectomy cervical ripening in prevention of uterine adhesion post etc 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 extremely impressed Napoleon with the list of users that are you have provided that if you want to tie a tourniquet let's say you are doing a myomectomy surgery right there's a myomectomy surgery that you want to do there are multiple myomas here and these are the location of the uterine arteries and you want to tie like a like a purse string like a you know like a, like you tie around the uh, around the waist if you want to try tie it around the waist like a belt there you know so that can be used yes you can use it like a tourniquet also in those situations you can also use it for a method of cervical ripening i mean you can introduce it here inside the cervical canal right and that's uh, that's your cervical canal and you are going to introduce it here and then you are going to inflate the bulb of the Foley's. So this mechanical bulb of the Foley's, you know, then you have inflated it. It will act to dilate the cervix. It will act as a met mechanical method for the release of prostaglandin. So it can be used as a method for induction of labor as well. The procedure is called as... Uh, the procedure is called as uh, Foley's catheterization here. You can do that inside the uterine cavity, but you don't have to introduce it all the way into the uterine cavity. You just had to place it inside the cervix. So that is called as a transcervical balloon catheter transcervical balloon catheter so you can use it for that purpose also and once you inflate the balloon 
it is going to release the prostaglandins in the cervix and that will help to promote cervical ripening and the mechanical effect of the balloon will also help in cervical dilatation as well right so you can use it as a method for induction of labor as well so there's so many other where you know nice use and so many innovative use of using the foley's catheter in obstetrics okay now let's have a look at the types of forceps which we see in the labor room. So can you identify these forceps for me? Can you identify these forceps for me? <clears throat> so these are the forceps which are coming with fedestrated blades. If I ask you to identify these forceps for me, what are these forceps? Anybody, what are these types of forceps there guys? These are your these are your Simpsons forceps. Simpsons forceps are the ones which have the fenestrated blades. If you look at the other forceps, these are forceps which are smaller than the Simpsons forceps. These are forceps which have a smaller shank. I mean, these are the blades of the forceps, right? These are the handles of the forceps. And these are the shank of the forceps, right? So you can see here that the shank of the forceps is much smaller, okay? So they don't go too deep into the vagina. They don't go too deep into the vagina. So what are these forceps here? No, these are not Piper's forceps. Uh, these are not Piper's forceps. Which forceps are these? These are what we call as the Wrigley's forceps. These are what we call as the Wrigley's forceps, also commonly called as the outlet forceps, outlet forceps, right? So both the Simpson forceps and Wrigley's forceps, they come with fenestrated blades, okay? Both come with fenestrated blades. The difference is that this particular Wrigley's forceps, it will look much smaller to you as compared to the Simpson's forceps. They will look smaller, why? Because they have a much smaller shank and they are what we also commonly called as the outlet forceps and these Simpsons forceps they are also commonly called as the low forceps right now low forceps and outlet forceps is the difference between the type of forceps application I mean low forceps are applied when the station of the head is plus two when the station of the head is plus two station and outlet forceps are applied when the head is on the perineum right like, like I shown you on the figure of the episiotomy when the scalp was visible so when the scalp is visible when the scalp is visible or when the head is on the perineum or when the head is on the perineum if at that time you apply forceps that particular kind of forceps application is called as outlet forceps right so outlet forceps apply karne ke liye the head doesn't have to be too high up okay head is low down into the pelvis so you don't want forceps to go too inside into the vagina that's why you have a smaller forceps with the smaller shank and that's why these are the forceps that are used for that purpose okay now what are these forceps here two other forceps i'm showing you so this forcep here on the left side they have a smooth blade smooth blade these are non-fenestrated blades can you appreciate the difference they are very much like the simpsons forceps the difference being that they have non-fenestrated blades these are the tucker mclean forceps these are the tucker mclean forceps right and it is often said that these tucker mclean forceps they are particularly used for the rounded heads rounded fetal heads in a case of multi-paris women rounded fetal heads in a case of multi-paris women and it is often said that these fenestrated blades of the simpsons forcep they help when there is a molded head when there is a molded head in a case of delivery okay so for rounded fetal heads in multi-paris Tucker McLean's are particularly useful, okay? And even if, you know, even if the Tucker McLean's are not available, it doesn't mean that you can't use other forceps in the same situation. I mean, you can use the other forceps in the same situation as well. But yes, the Tucker McLean has an advantage that it is very good for applying them on the rounded heads in a case of multi-paris women and your molded head fits in better in these fenestrated blade of Simpson's forceps. Now, what are these forceps here? on the right 
what are these forceps here on the right they are also again looking very similar to the simpson's forceps very similar to the simpson's forceps how are you differentiating can you appreciate the type of lock that is present in these forceps can you appreciate the type of lock that is present in these forceps so one uh, the one blade fits into the other blade this kind of lock is called as the english lock this kind of lock is called as the english lock now if you want to differentiate between simpsons and this forceps you can see here there is a uh, there is a quadrangular box there is a quadrangular box here this is what we call as the sliding lock this is what is called as the sliding lock so when you see forceps looking very similar to the simpsons forceps but they have a sliding lock instead of the english lock these are your keelens forceps these are your keelens forceps and ali rightly saying that these are used for rotational maneuvers on the head so these are the keelens rotational forceps okay so these are the forceps now again i am also certain that much, most of you might not have seen these keelens forceps being used particularly and neither are the examiners too fond of asking about keelens forceps too much because rotational forceps application i mean applying the forces on the baby's head and rotating the baby's head rotational forceps have more or less gone obsolete i mean no longer being practiced in routine clinical practice for forceps uh, application and rotation of the head is something that is not being commonly done and that's why it's often a question which is not pursued by examiners during the examinations okay so rotational forceps are less seldom used hardly ever used now what we are using is either the low forceps application or we are doing the outlet forceps application right so identification of forceps is important they might hand you simpson's forceps to identify they might hand you wrigley's forceps to identify i mean these are the two very very common forceps that i have seen in my uh, undergrad and postgrad years now when the moment you identify the forceps the next question that arises is which forceps is the left forceps and which forceps is the right forceps i mean they are going to place the forceps like this in front of you on the table and the next question is now pick up these forceps dear and tell me which forcep is the left forceps and which forceps is the right forceps now how do you identify that if there are so many for i mean right now in this figure i'm only showing you two forceps two blades if i give you four five blades like that spread on the table and all lying flat in front of you how are you going to tell me that which forcep is the left forcep and which forceps is the right forceps so yes anybody answering that let's just quiz you guys here anybody answering that how do you identify which forceps is the left forceps and which forceps is the right forceps okay can you see here these are two forceps placed in front of you how are you going to identify which one is left which one is right pick them up in your hands pick them up in your hands place them on the table in a way that they are resting standing they are resting standing like this place them up like in a manner that they rest standing and they are not lying flat like this on the table they are standing they are standing on the table like this okay so the moment you place them like this then try to lock them together try to lock them together use your don't just keep looking and try to answer examiner wants to quiz you there so take your time lift the blades in your hand and lock them in front of the examiner okay when you lock them and they are nice perfect fit together when you lock them up this blade of the forceps this blade of the forceps which will come in your left hand you'll start if you lock them in front of you you'll be holding this by your left hand and it will go towards the left side of the mother so yes ali you're going to assemble them in front of you all right there's no a uh, restriction of uh, there the examiner is not going to say don't touch my forceps okay so left hand pe jo aapke aayegi okay the one that you'll grasp by your left hand that forceps will go to the left side of the mother that forceps will go to the left side of the mother and that is your left 
forceps. That is your left forceps. And when you're holding the forceps in your hands, there will be one forcep which will you which will you which you'll hold by your right hand. So the one that you'll hold by your right hand will go into the right side of the mother, right side of the mother, and that is your right forceps. That is your right-sided forceps right so that is another question that they ask you is how do you identify which blade is the left blade which blade is the right blade so the blade that goes to the left side of the mother is the left sided forceps and the blade that goes to the right side of the mother is the right sided forceps so let me have a look at it here let me show it to you on this particular figure I have to take the slide forward a little bit. Can you see here? This is the left side, left blade. Okay. You are introducing it on the left side of the mother. So that is your left blade. That is your left blade. Okay. Now moving back to the other questions that are asked once you identify the forceps. The other questions that are asked are, what are the indications of instrumental delivery? When are you going to use instrumental delivery, whether forceps or whether vacuum? What are the very, very important indications? So the two main indications of instrumental delivery is whenever you want to cut short the second stage of labor. That means whenever you want to hasten the delivery. And in the second stage of labor, that is when the cervix has been fully dilated. So whenever you want to hasten the delivery in the second stage of labor, we can use instrumental delivery, either forceps or vacuum. And two such situations which will require me to hasten the delivery in the second stage is if there is a second stage fetal distress or there is a prolonged second stage with maternal exhaustion. I mean, the mother is too tired of bearing down and she's having lost her strength and she's absolutely not bearing down she's not cooperating second stage has gotten prolonged and then I want to help the woman out and I want to cut short the second stage of labor these are two widely used indications for applying instrumental delivery now the moment you give this answer to me I will ask you the next question okay you have satisfied your indication okay you want to apply forceps to cut short the second stage of labor so how are you going to proceed how are you going to proceed so what is your answer there you've decided to conduct instrumental delivery how are you going to proceed to this you should answer that you know I want to satisfy the prerequisites for uh, instrumental delivery I want to make sure that this particular case is the correct case to apply the instrument okay so second stage fetal distress is happening or it's been a prolonged stage with maternal exhaustion I can only apply instrument if the criteria for instrumentation are met so how are you going to proceed you are going to say that I'm going to satisfy the prerequisites for instrumental vaginal delivery I'm going to make sure that I am have uh, the, this particular case is a good case to apply forceps and safe case to apply forceps or vacuum and how are you going to proceed with that you first do a per abdominal examination so you go step by step you don't say I'll quickly do a PV you have to do a per abdominal examination first in the per abdominal examination you the first thing that you're going to ensure is that the head should not be palpable above the pelvic brim okay so you'll recognize the symphysis pubis there on per abdominal examination head should not be palpable above the symphysis pubis above the level of pelvic brim that is the first thing that you are going to ensure next you are going to move on to do the per vaginal examination in the per vaginal examination you need to ensure that the cervix is fully dilated the membranes are absent the head is rotated the station is plus two or more and there should be no evidence of cephalo pelvic disproportion there should be no evidence of cpd because if there is evidence of cpd and you apply forceps or vacuum and force a vaginal delivery it can lead to fetal injuries it can lead to maternal injuries it can do more damage than it will do any good so next you do the per vaginal examination and find out whether the cervix has been fully 
fully dilated, the membranes are absent, the head has rotated, the station is plus two or more and there should be no evidence of CPD. Now, why am I insisting on doing a per abdominal examination first and next doing a per vaginal examination? Why is this sequence so important to maintain and why am I not doing uh, just a PV examination and just don't do this per abdominal examination? I mean, what's the, what's the deal? I mean, I could just see the station as plus two or more and that should satisfy my criteria. Why am I emphasizing on doing a per abdominal examination first? Can anybody figure that out? Can anybody figure that out? What is the need of doing this per abdominal examination? I mean, why have I emphasized on it that this should be your first step and then you should do a per vaginal examination? You should do this total examination in that sequence. Why is that important? It is important. Can you see here? Can you see here in this figure? Now look at this figure here. The whole head has gone deep into the pelvis. The head has gone deep into the pelvis. This occiput is lying behind the symphysis pubis. So it's a rotated head. It's a rotated head occiput occiput is lying behind the symphysis pubis it would, it would look something like this the sutures would look something like this that would be the posterior fontanel and that would be the anterior fontanel in the front so that would be your rotated head okay and the occiput lying behind the symphysis pubis all the head has gone deep into the pelvis and then at the level of the ischial spines at the level of the ischial spines the station is the station is zero now i'm saying that the station should be plus two or more plus two or more so when all the head has gone down into the pelvis it is certain that the station is definitely near plus two station is definitely near plus two station is this leading point of the fetal skull in relation to the ischial spines right now what is in this situation in this situation can you see what is the problem if I do a PV examination, if I do a PV examination, my fingers are going to strike here. My fingers are going to strike here, right? And I will get a false sense of station, a false sense of station on per vaginal examination. I'll feel that the head has come down. The head has come down, whereas the head is actually here. The head is actually here. Now, why is this false sense of station happening? This false sense of station is happening because of this caput formation. Can you see a large caput succedaneum? A caput which is huge, caput plus plus. Can you see that there is this molding happening? Can you see the parietal bones that are overlapping? Can you see this molding happening? Molding which is very, very severe. Molding overlapping of the uh, parietal bones at the level of the sagittal suture okay it's considered severe molding if it's fixed overlapping so caput and molding will be uh, significant and a, a huge uh, caput or a severe molding can be suggestive of underlying cephalopelvic disproportion and then i'll get a false sense of station on pv i will feel that the station is plus three or beyond plus two when in reality the station is much higher okay so then this is not a good way to apply forceps i mean i need to satisfy the criteria of station being plus two or more that is why it is important to see how much of the head is palpable above the symphysis pubis above the pelvic brim in this particular situation the head is two fifth above the pelvic brim so now I know that the head is still above the pelvic brim. If the head is still above the pelvic brim, then this station that I'm feeling on PV is a false station. So I have to ensure that the head is not palpable above the pelvic brim. And that's why I should first go ahead with the per abdominal examination and then I should go ahead with the per vaginal examination and satisfy the criteria. Okay. And after I've satisfied the criteria, taking the woman's consent is very, very important. Consent should be taken and bladder should be emptied before applying instruments. So these are the prerequisites for instrumental delivery. Keep in mind and do not forget that sometimes on PV examination, especially when there is a large caput or the molding is severe, you can get a false sense of station on PV and you can falsely get reassured that 
that the station is plus two plus three plus four to avoid that mishap it is very very important to see and ensure that the head should not be palpable above the pelvic brim okay now what is the correct application of forceps? So like I showed you in this figure there, correct application of forceps ensure that you introduce the left blade first, okay? The left blade is introduced first, okay? And once you introduce the left blade, the blade is held from the handles like this, okay? In a pen holding fashion. And the other hand, the right hand in this situation is guiding the introduction of the blade. When you use this right hand to guide the introduction of the blade you prevent injury to the maternal vagina and the maternal tissue so the left blade goes to the left side of the mother then once it is inserted and put in place the assistant is going to hold it for you okay so that it doesn't move then you will introduce the right blade subsequently and once you have introduced both the blades you are going to lock those forceps so when the forceps get easily locked when the forceps get easily locked it's a signal that they are applied correctly and when they are applied correctly like in this situation that's your occiput that's your posterior fontanelle that's your sagittal suture the blades of the suture are equidistant from the suture the blades of the forceps are equidistant from the sutures and they get easily locked if they are not getting easily locked that means they are incorrectly applied and that means that you should never force them into uh, you can, you should never force them to uh, to lock them okay or you should never start applying traction uh, before ensuring that they are locked because when the forceps get easily locked that ensures that they are applied correctly if they are not getting locked that means there is some problem in the application in this situation always reconsider your position always reconsider and reapply and do not apply too much traction neither start pulling straight away. So you can see here the head is not rotated. That's your occiput. That's your posterior fontanelle here. That's your sagittal suture here. And the blades are not equidistant from the suture. So that means they are incorrectly applied. So in this situation, you should always reconsider and reapply the forceps. Okay, so keep that in mind as well. Now, what about the traction on the forceps? So you can see here the traction has to be applied not here not here at the handle but here at here where the handle is joining the shanks okay so this is how the forceps are held they should be traction should be applied in a direction which is consistent with the birth canal so at the initial part you have to apply traction in the downwards and backward direction as the head comes as the head it becomes visible at the introitus you start applying traction in the straight direction and then in the upward direction so the axis of the traction also needs to be changed accordingly so initial traction is in the downward and backward direction okay once the head becomes visible once the scalp becomes visible at the introitus, the traction direction is changed in the forward direction and later on in the upward direction. But the traction should be applied in this manner in a steady way, in a steady way, not broken traction, but continuous traction needs to be applied. Once the baby's head is delivered, we dislodge the forceps, unlock them and remove the blades immediately once the head delivers okay now what are these instruments what are these instruments what are these instrument guys these are the vacuum cups these are the vacuum cups which you have seen in the labor room so these are the metallic cups which were much used earlier but i'm sure now in all our labor rooms the silicone cups have replaced the metallic cups so these are the silicone cups right so the metallic cups are more rigid they are more traumatic to the fetal scalp the silicone cups on the other hand are more malleable and they are less traumatic on the fetal scalp and the end of this vacuum cup with the help of a tubing is connected to the suction creating device which we see in the labor room and then there is this uh, these are your vacuum cups or your ventus cups okay vacuum cups or ventus cups okay now there is another device which is called as the kiwi omni cup 
okay kiwi omnica so this is this device which is has a cup here it has a and again just like the vacuum cup it is to be placed on the fetus's scalp but the advantage here is that the vacuum creating device is handheld there is a handheld vacuum creating device okay so this cup is attached to this vacuum creating device by a thin tubing okay and when i press on this there is a there is a rod here which can be pressed down okay once i press on this rod what happens is vacuum is created in this device here in this connecting uh, tube here and in the connective tubing as well and that vacuum is transferred to the cup so this is a kiwi omni cup it is a handheld vacuum creating device in all of these devices no matter what we use okay no matter what cup we use no matter what suction creating device you use right the suction pressure that is usually considered adequate the suction pressure that is usually considered adequate liquid is about 0.8 kg per centimeter square that is equivalent to about 600 mm of mercury we don't need pressures more than this if we are going to use pressures more than this they are going to lead to fetal scalp injuries so suction pressures which correspond to 0.8 kg per centimeter square which is roughly equivalent to 600 mm of mercury these are good enough pressures if you are going to think that i will use more pressure that will deliver the baby let me try with more pressure no such pressures are good enough if you use extensive pressure pressures more than this are not recommended because they are going to cause fetal scalp injuries otherwise now when you apply the vacuum you have to focus on the correct application of the vacuum as well so vacuum when correctly applied has to rest on the baby's scalp like this and you can appreciate here that it is placed here on the top of the head like this here right now this particular position is very very important because we need to ensure that the when that when we place the cup when we place the cup the center of the cup should be at the flexion point the center of the cup should be at the flexion point now this flexion point is somewhere which is 3 cm anterior to the posterior fontanelle 3 cm anterior to the flex uh, to the posterior fontanelle or 6 cm posterior to the anterior fontanelle now obviously you can understand that you know it becomes difficult i mean this is theoretical right this is theoretical it becomes difficult to count exactly centimeter wise you know where the cup is and what is it so a rough clinical guide is that most of these vacuum cups most of these vacuum cups have a diameter of about have a uh, have a radius of about 3 cm okay so what is important to note here is if you place the cup in a situation if you place the cup with the rim of the cup with the rim of the cup just touching the posterior fontanelle just touching the posterior fontanelle that should be good enough that's a clinical clue okay rim of the cup should just touch the posterior fontanel here the other rough guide would be that the anterior rim of the cup the anterior rim of the cup should be about 3 cm or let's say two finger breadths two finger breadths above the anterior fontanel so once we have placed the cup on the baby scalp we digitally feel whether we have placed it correctly or not now what is the digital feel what is the clue clinical clue that the rim of the cup posteriorly should just be touching the posterior fontanel and not covering the posterior fontanel otherwise you placed it incorrectly and the other clue would be that anteriorly the rim of the cup should be about two Two finger breadths above the anterior fontanel. If you satisfy these two criteria, you sh should be certain that you have placed the vacuum cup correctly. That correct application meaning that the center of the cup is at the flexion. point because when you apply the cup here that flexes the head if you're going to apply the cup here 
if you're going to apply the cup to backward to behind it is going to lead to deflection of the head that is why this point is also called as the flexion point this point is called a flexion point for a reason because when you apply the vacuum cup here it flexes the fetal head that is why this point is called as the flexion point okay so so many things you get to know i by remembering the flexion point okay there's a reason why it is called the flexion point okay now identify these forceps for me identify these forceps for me this is your last instrument in the labor room identify these forceps for me and these are not sponge holding forceps these are not sponge holding forceps they look like sponge holding forceps okay there are curved sponge holding forceps also they look like sponge holding forceps but they are not sponge holding forceps there is no latch here there is no latch no lock here what are these forceps anybody has an idea what are these forceps has anybody seen these forceps ovum forceps ovum forceps yeah they are quite similar to ovum forceps ovum forceps uh, ovum forceps will not have these serrations on the inside okay and ovum forceps are mostly more more rounded at the end i mean ovum forceps i showed you yesterday what ovum forceps look like okay so these are which we call these are very long another important clue here that this is not the valsalum the gametu valsalum i showed yesterday it was having tooth here at the top tooths tooth here at the top like jaw like mouth it had and these are particularly long these are particularly long these are very very long forceps particularly satya now long i think long clicked is your answer with you kelly's long forceps very good kelly's forceps these are your these will be particularly long okay they will have no latch they will look very much like the uh, like the sponge holding forceps they will have serrations on the inside but they will have no latch these are kelly's long forceps very good satya now satya where have you seen these kelly's long forceps being used what is these used they are specifically used for one purpose only in obstetrics now i have delivered the baby also okay by either vacuum or by forceps and what are these particularly uh, long kelly's forceps particularly used for in the labor room have you seen them being used they are used for postpartum iucd insertion a very very upcoming topic to be discussed i feel in the labor room in the labor room particularly because the government of india recommends it a lot this ppiucd insertion postpartum iud insertion okay so yes it is puerperal insertion of the copper containing intrauterine device for contraception purposes so have you seen this uh, ppiucd being inserted do you know of this i mean ram 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 if you want to hold the cervix with these forceps okay but then they have serrations but then they have serrations inside so they're not like sponge holding forceps they don't have serrations so kelly's forceps will have serrations so they will be slightly more traumatic so they're not designed for that purpose to hold the cervix but yes in uh, in place in situations if you don't have a novum forceps you can use these forceps we do, we do that all the time but that is particularly designed for insertion of postpartum iucd so have you guys had the opportunity to seeing this have you guys heard about this let me know have you guys uh, do you guys know about this postpartum iucd insertion being recommended by the government of india also being endorsed by the who and also by, by the other international organizations do you know of this postpartum iucd insertion immediately after delivery within 10 minutes of placental delivery that's why i want to introduce to you here in the procedure which is done in the labor room this is a procedure which is done in the labor room which is called as postpartum iucd insertion the timing is within 10 minutes of placental delivery okay by 10 minutes of placental delivery within 10 minutes of placental delivery we have this opportunity of introducing postpartum iucd also 
okay so there are various timings of iucd insertion i mean i've talked about that at great length when we've discussed contraception i mean there's interval uh, intrauterine device insertion there is also you can insert copper t also uh, in the postpartum period but within 48 hours of delivery you can also introduce copper t in the labor room itself and this has become a very favorite question of the examiners these days okay so jyotsna you've not seen ali you haven't seen and gemichu has some idea about it and i think napoleon also has some idea about it so let's just discuss this here a bit okay the timing of this postpartum iucd insertion is within 10 minutes of placental delivery now what will you ensure before insertion so imagine yourself like so the woman has delivered okay her placenta is out okay she has been counseled well in advance she has been you, you can't just drop the question on her head like that I want to insert a copper TV for you. I mean, she's just delivered for God's sake. So she has been counseled well in advance regarding whether she wants a postpartum copper tea insertion or not. If she has agreed to that procedure, well and good. So what will you ensure before the insertion? Speak to the woman and confirm that she agrees to the procedure and that she has been counseled about the risks and benefits and advantages and everything contraception counseling has been done prior to her delivery so this is first thing that you will ensure second you'll check her eligibility whether she is a fit case again to introduce copper tea again because you are introducing a foreign device so you need to ensure that she has not had a history of prolonged rupture of membranes right it should not be like you know this was a woman who was induced in labor or this was a woman who had a prolonged history of leaking for 18 hours for 20 hours for 24 hours i mean in that woman i would not prefer to put this uh, postpartum iucd i mean it should not be a woman who's been referred from the village with obstructed labor and then she's had the cesarean section and there are so many other compounding factors which can predispose to infection i mean then i don't want to go for postpartum iucd insertion so you need to check the eligibility there should be no history of prolonged ruptured membranes there should be no history of chorioamnonitis i mean it should not be a woman who has delivered after a chorioamnonitis episode after a history of fever and uh, genital tract infection so that case i will not uh, insert this device and there should be no unresolved pph i mean it should not be like you know she's bleeding and i'm hell bent on inserting the copper tea so i should be ensured that after delivery of the placenta there is no abnormal bleeding there is no unresolved pph she should be doing well and only then i will start introducing this device okay and consent again it becomes a very very important part so you have to recheck on the consent and before introducing the copper tea right so the woman has just delivered i mean you've stitched the episiotomy as well please do please don't say that i will you know uh, uh, introduce the copper tea and then i'll take care of the episiotomy i mean the woman's condition uh, becomes a priority first so any unresolved pps should not be there so the uh, episiotomy has been stitched she's doing fine you clean the perineal area you clean the abdomen do the vaginal toileting clear the cervix and the vagina do beta deal toileting and then proceed with the insertion so you can see here that this is a delivered woman and you can see we can see here this is the cervix okay this is the cervix that is visible here okay cervix that has just delivered okay cervix that is just delivered so it's very very soft so it is grasped by the over uh, by the sponge holding forceps these are the sponge holding forceps which are used to grasp the anterior lip of the cervix. A sim speculum has been introduced into the posterior vaginal wall and this is all allowing me to access the cervix, right? So after the toileting is done, I hold the anterior lip of the cervix and the sim speculum. Once I have put this in place, assistant is holding this uh, sim speculum for me. Uh, I will hand over the instruments to the assistant and then I will load the copper tea. So I will hold the copper tea like this on the Kelly's forceps. So on the Kelly's forceps, I will take out the copper tea and hold them like this. This is the copper tea. It's held like this. And then I will introduce these Kelly's forceps guiding inside the cervix. So I will introduce these Kelly's forceps now inside, okay, through the cervix. These are the Kelly's 
which were holding the property and I introduced them inside the cervix. Okay. Once I have introduced them inside the cervix, I remove the sponge holding forceps. I, I set the uh, anterior lip of the cervix free. So I don't do that anymore. I remove the sponge holding forceps from the anterior lip of the cervix. And then this step, placing the hand on the mother's abdomen is a very, very important step. What am I doing this uh, with this head so the hand what am i doing is that i am pushing the uterus up i am pushing the uterus up okay so woman has just delivered her uterus is here okay this is her umbilicus and the uterus is here so i am using my hand on top of her abdomen to push the uterus slightly up now that's a very very important step to take because in normally this is this is how the uterus is placed inside can you see after delivery so that's your umbilicus and that's your uh, uterus let's say so you can see that's your you are going through uh, the vagina here you can see that this is a, at an angle you can see this is at an angle the cervical canal and the rest of the uterine canal this is at an angle you need to straighten this angle to introduce the Kelly's forceps. So pushing the abdomen up by the hand straightens this angle and creates a path for us by which we can smoothly introduce the Kelly's forceps up through the uterine cavity right so i have started introducing the kelly's forceps i was holding the copper t at the end of the kelly's forceps and now i have introduced them inside can you see i'm taking them inside i'm taking the kelly's forceps inside the copper t is held i keep going keep going till i reach the fundus i keep going keep going till i reach the fundus the moment i will reach the fundus here i will feel it with my hand on the abdomen i mean i don't have to perforate the uterus so i will feel with my hand per abdominally that i have reached the fundus i'll feel a resistant and that's my clue i have to stop there once i have reached the fundus here i am going to open my forceps that's why they don't have a latch for easy opening and closing inside the uterine cavity so they don't have a latch for that reason so i'm going to put it all the way up here i'm going to drop the copper t there and then i'm going to open the forceps slightly open the forceps okay and then i'm going to bring the forceps to the right side slightly to the right side and i'm going to slowly slowly slide the forceps out i'm going to slowly slowly slide the forceps out tracing the lateral wall of the vagina because our lateral walls of the uterus because I don't want to disturb this property I've placed it there so I don't want to entangle the threads and you know bring the property down while I'm taking out the Kelly's forceps so to ensure that the forceps are pulled out while keeping the forceps slightly open while keeping the forceps slightly open so that the thread of the copper tea doesn't get entangled in the forceps right so keep that precaution in mind and that is how they are pulled out in a slightly open state not completely open or wide open just slightly open okay so once i slide them outside the next question that arises and that is often asked is that what if you have inserted the copper tea inside will you be able to see the thread once you have taken this uh, kelly's out once you've taken these kelly's out would you would you be would you be seeing the copper tea thread like when we do interval incision, when we do interval incision, insertion, we see the copper tea thread at the vagina. When we do interval incision, insertion, we place the copper tea here and we see the thread in the vagina and then we cut it short, right? In this situation, we have placed the copper tea here. So the thread will not be seen at the os, right? Isn't it? So when you have placed it correctly, this thread ends here. This thread will not be seen at the os. If you are seeing the thread at the os, that means you have not placed it. This is a big uterus. This is a big uterus, postpartum uterus. If your thread is coming out with you, if your thread is coming out with you, that means you not you have not placed the copper tea at the correct situation. So at the end of the procedure, 
at the end of the procedure once you've taken out these kelly's forceps at the end of the procedure you should not be seeing this thread coming out of the os through the cervix here if you are seeing this that means you've placed it incorrectly they should be placed here if they are placed correctly the thread ends inside the uterus only so thread should not be visible right so please remember at the end of the procedure the copper t thread should not come out of the cervix if it does that's your clue that's your clue that means you've not placed it correctly so this is about PPIUCD insertion the important aspects to remember is that under which situations you will not prefer to put it if the woman is otherwise healthy yes of course you can put it you can put it after delivery of the placenta yes the episiotomy should be yes the episiotomy should be stitched before that no 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 Ali no sound no sound your sound is your you postpartum your uterus is very big dear postpartum uterus is very big it is reaching all the way up to the umbilicus your sound is not helping no 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 all you have to do if you start introducing the sound inside first of all the length of the sound itself might fall short second is it's such a thin postpartum uterus such a soft uterus and it's such a thin sound you know you can end up perforating so we don't want that that is why you know kelly's forceps are used because they're, they're more rounded so there is there's more rounded you see the design of the kelly's forceps the ends are round so the chances of perforation are also less and the guidance that we are not going through and through the fundus is by this hand which we place on the abdomen okay so that is our guide when we introduce the kelly's forceps if these are the kelly's forceps okay and i'm introducing them and once they reach the fundus there once they reach the fundus there i'm not too rapid like this i'm very slow in introducing slowly slowly i'm going inside the moment i reach the fundus i feel a resistance and that's my clue and i stop there and then I open the forceps, I release the uh, copper tea inside and I will slowly slide down my Kelly's forceps. Keeping in mind the precaution that I should not keep them closed. If I keep them closed, there is a chance that the thread might be enclosed or the copper tea might be enclosed and I might pull it out. Or I might be pulling at the... Uh, you know decidua or the uh, endometrial lining here and i might damage and you know grasp that in the forceps so they are brought down or pulled out when they are just slightly open okay now i am getting certain very very interesting suggestions lakshmi on how to conduct a normal delivery on a video actually so uh, let me figure that out how can that be done can that be done in the hospital premises so i will work on that i mean that is going to be a challenge i like that challenge as well and a normal labor so i did a session on uh, the mechanism of labor but i would like to do that on the youtube platform let's see that maternal pelvis and fetal skull so all of you want to read about the labor all of you want to read about the labor particularly that's what i gather from there ali can we insert after 10 minutes of placental delivery preferably within 10 minutes of placental delivery otherwise the uterus starts getting intense con uterus also starts getting contractions you know it will start getting contracted and what will happen is that your os will get closed it's within 10 minutes of delivery why because because after delivery your os will get closed so you have to take that window of opportunity where you can introduce the forceps with ease you know once this os starts getting closed then you don't want to create undue trauma and you know land up perforating the cervix or the uterus there so that's your window there when the os is still soft and slightly open open enough to introduce these kelly's forceps that's why the window of opportunity is preferably within 10 minutes of delivery of the placenta you do later than that the os gets closed and then it becomes difficult to do the procedure with ease that's the thing okay any more questions guys
any more questions about the labor room procedures any other procedures that you want to do i also got a suggestion on uh, talking about the drugs that are used in the labor room drugs that are used in the obstetrics and the gynae so uh, that is also a session that i am planning and i would like to take your suggestion uh, i would like to take your suggestion on that also if you want to have a session on the drugs that are used in the labor room like prostaglandin drugs the synthetic drugs that we find in the labor room like methergen and oxytocin if you want a session on that uh, you can please tell me that is anemia an indication for tjis uh, what's tjis uh, first of all please I'm, I'm i'm it's not coming to me what tjis is ram D, uh, Dr. House, uh, the PDF of these classes unfortunately have not been uploaded on the YouTube platform but uh, if you go to my special classes which are there on the plus platform they are also special these special classes these are free these are free special classes on their academy platform and they come with the PDFs they come with the PDFs okay now um there's another question there concerning a vacuum when will one day what when will okay what will one do if it's a failed vacuum i think that's what you're trying to ask napoleon uh, multiple instrumentations are not recommended so if you apply if you decide to apply vacuum it failed second attempt or reattempt at vacuum or forceps application after a failed vacuum or vice versa or let's say uh, vacuum up, uh, application after for failed forceps is not recommended okay the safest option would be to not take it to to take her up for cesarean section with the failed instrumentation also because then if you do multiple instrumentation the chances of fetal injuries and asphyxiation are more the chances of maternal injuries are also more and also keep in mind that when a method fails it is likely that your criteria might not have been satisfied and that is why your instrument failed in the first place so persisting in that scenario is a temptation that all of us who practice in the labor room have had in time at some point in the other and all of us warn each other not to go for uh, uh, you know multiple instruments in the same patient one after the other i mean because it can lead to more complications and then uh, one has to answer to the our main answer answerability is to the patient isn't it so i have got so many suggestions that i'm having a hard time reading your messages as well so uh, ali you want to say that you want me to upload your capsule course of labor on youtube uh, uh, ali i have been talking about labor on youtube for such a long time that i have taken a lot of sessions on labor also but if you want me to take live discussions on labor i can do that so uh, instead of uploading that capsule course separately what we can do is also start discussing labor in the youtube platform as well we could do that as well Joe Jotsna likes my idea on drugs, so I take that as a yes for that session. And uh, Shubham, what's your question? Which fetal position is common? Uh, the most common fetal position in the onset of during the onset of labor is left occipital transverse, and the second most common is left occipital anterior. Okay. Now steps in perineal injury uh, repair third and fourth degree. Thank you. So Gemichu, if I will go back to this figure here, uh, see this is all. Um, how do I go back to that figure of 
episiotomy. Okay, so let's just have a look at this figure of the episiotomy here and try to figure out that what had what would have happened if the uh, perineal tear would come, there would have been a complete perineal tear or uh, an injury involving the external anal sphincter as well as the internal anal sphincter and rectal mucosa. Then the repair is very similar to the episiotomy repair, but the only uh, uh, point to note uh, Gemichu in that situation is that we have to stitch the rectal mucosa first. Okay, we stitch the rectal mucosa first, then we stitch the internal anal sphincter, then we repair the external anal sphincter, and then the rest of the repair is like the episiotomy repair. Okay, so that is what we are, uh, that is your doubt there. And uh, Jyotsna, you want a video on examination and obstetric maneuvers. Uh, now, Jyotsna, I will take this opportunity to also guide you towards a chapter where I have already taken it on YouTube. If you can watch that video and, uh, you know, uh, get me with your doubts there. So the uh, links of those videos I will provide to you on this chat box as well. So there is already a session on obstetric maneuvers. Okay, there. But yes, I, I think I can do a video on that as well. Now, uh, Subham, you read uh, LOT is common, but uh, you, when you went to labor room, most of the delivered baby were facing the left thigh. That's exactly what will happen in a left occipital transverse delivery, Shubham exactly what will happen when it will be occiput if your baby has delivered and the baby is facing the left thigh the occiput of the baby will face the left thigh left occipital transverse is the most common you vouch my word for that you can read up in the textbook also okay No, no, no. Shubham, uh, unfortunately, Shubham, when you've seen more of right occipital deliveries. But uh, but uh, Shubham, the most common is LOT. That's for certain. Okay. Chalo. So some very interesting uh, you know, suggestions coming from you guys. From what I gain from the group that is here active on the chat is that you people want a thorough discussion on labor and its aspect. So I will work on that for the month of November on YouTube. We'll take up the discussion of labor and conductance of normal delivery as well. Lakshmi rightly pointing out. Okay, fine. We can do that. So that is what I'm going to plan for you guys in the coming month of November. So have a good day, guys. Have a great day. And I'll see you in the month of November now with a fresh set of uh, YouTube sessions. All right. Bye-bye. Take care. I'll end the session for today now.